Hi guys, Gary from Repair Hacks here. Today's video is about efficiency. It's about designing our bots and automations with performance in mind. It's about getting the most return on investment on our RPA licenses and other resources involved. I was able to come up with 10 tips that will either save running time or reduce the idle time of your bots. Watch the video to find out more. One might think the bots are already running 24-7, 365 days per year, so does it really pay off to make them just a bit faster? They are great anyways. In the next minutes, I will try to build a business case for that. It all comes down to volumes. Let's imagine you are working in a large company and you have managed to automate the processing of your invoices up to 90%. That would be a super great achievement Let's say there would be around 1 million invoices per year in one country. For a large operation, that's not an artificially inflated number. And let's say that the company operates in 50 countries and this automation was rolled out everywhere. So 90% of the 1 million invoices processing was automated in all countries and there would be around 45 million invoices processed every year by the bots. Now let's imagine you were able to save only one second per invoice processing by using one of these 10 tips mentioned in this video. They would translate to 520 man days of savings per year, or robot days because they run 24 hours per day, not only 8 hours on average. Only for one second saved. And licensing costs are not everything. There are hardware costs and maintenance costs linked to the VMs that the bots are running on as well. Now let's start our list of tips and tricks to improve either the automation running time or the bot's idle time. Design the architecture of the bots with speed in mind. Split up the automation in smaller bots to allow for scaling up, meaning to allow running more instances of a bot to avoid bottlenecks. Let's say you have to work with an app or website that happens to be offline more often than normal. If you have your all automation in only one bot, it will just hang around that app or website that is unresponsive. But with a smart architecture design, you could save a lot of running time and potentially avoid bottlenecks as well. You could have a smaller bot dealing with that website that communicates with the rest of the process via queues. This way, the data to be processed with uh, that app could be piled up upon a queue when the app is unresponsive without eating too much running time. And whenever the app would be back online, multiple instances of that bot could be launched to quickly process those pending items. With the new orchestrator, bots can be easily triggered based on queue items, making the whole bot interaction easy to set up. Use background processes whenever possible. Background processes are processes that do not need any user interaction. If you are unfamiliar with them, watch the video I've made on how to create background processes. You will find the link in the description below as well as on the top right corner of the screen. As of mid of 2020, multiple background processes could run in parallel on the same bot with the same user. This has quite some savings potential when it comes to bot license savings, and it could reduce the number of total licenses needed. However, keep in mind that for them to run in parallel on the same bot, you have to have an attended bot license. It will not work with an unattended one. Often we need to wait for a website or app to load. Waiting a set number of seconds comes in handy with the delay activity. But while it's convenient, it's not very effective. Delay waits the preset number of seconds regardless of how fast the app or website loads. And to cater for traffic fluctuations, we often set that waiting time higher just to be sure we wait long enough to avoid a selector not found exception. So we are wasting bot running time even when the network speed is high. The alternative is using something like wait element appear activity, also called find element activity. This waits for an element to appear on the app or website while it has a timeout value, after which it will throw an exception if the element does not appear at all. In case the element appears faster though, it will not wait for the whole timeout time. So it saves time. Also, it returns a boolean value that tells us if the element is there or not, making further decisions easier to implement. And it has additional nice features, like wait for the element to become visible or for it to become active. 
giving us fine-grained control on how to react in case the app behaves unexpectedly. Use simulate type or simulate click whenever possible. These are options in activities properties. If selected, it simulates the click with the technology of the target application. It means it is not really using the keyboard and mouse for that, and it translates to higher speed. The downside, however, is that it is not compatible with all desktop applications. If it behaves strangely, just go with this option unticked. That will make sure the type into or the click will be performed with the hardware driver, which is slower but more stable. Simulate type also does not allow for sending special keys, like an enter, for example, after a value, inside the same activity. The parallel activity allows to schedule two or more child sequence activities for processing at the same time. But they do not really run in parallel. One activity is processed from one of the branches, and when it is completed, it starts processing another one from another branch and so on. But the order of execution of the activities across the branches is not the same every time. So the parallel branches are not processed really concurrently, but overall, using the parallel activity could save some time. Use comparable activities that run faster than their equivalents. For example, the Excel read range activity runs much faster than the workbook read range activity, and they kind of do the same thing. I will not go now into the details. I have created a detailed video on the similarities and differences between the two. You can find the link in the description below and on the upper right corner. But the idea is that the first activity is several times faster than the second one, so if it meets the needs of your automation, it could be used to save some bot running time. Invest time in building good classic selectors, if possible. Resort to CV activities only when nothing else works. The new computer vision activities are great and stable, but they do take up considerably longer than their classic counterparts. I've created a video on the CV activities like click, type into, or find element, and in the new version, they are even further improved. But the reality remains, they are very slow. So they should not be abused, but rather used as plan B or even plan C, when nothing else seems to work in a stable way. Because the new CV activities are so great and easy to use, especially with the new local server option, the temptation to abuse them and not spend too much time on trying to find a good and stable classic selector is high. Use APIs as often as possible, instead of working with the application UI. Use Buppies in SAP, for example. I've created a complete tutorial on that. Most of the mature applications you need to interact with have an API. Using an API is much faster and much more robust. It does take time to investigate and find out how it works, but the runtime savings could be huge. It could easily 10x, 20x, or maybe even 50x the speed. It's like having taken the decision to buy Tesla stock when it was only $200, before the split, or Amazon stock when it was only $300 early last year. Consider the VM resources. This is not an obvious one. Increasing the resources of the virtual machines that are running the bots to increase the running speed of the automations. This is the only one where we have to invest money in hardware in the hopes to save up more on the software license side. It would be interesting to really do an analysis there and try to find out where is the break-even point or the balance between hardware resources and saved processing time and licensing costs. And from which point on it becomes more profitable to invest more in hardware because it saves more software costs. The new orchestrator has new functionalities when it comes to triggers. Running each bot every five minutes to check if there is something for it to do can become a thing of the past in most cases now. Because bots can easily communicate via queues and bots can be triggered when items are made available on these queues can avoid a lot of useless running time. Before, we had to start a bot to check if some files or emails exist. Now, if that bot is part of a large automation, it could communicate through queues and trigger that bot only when there is something for it to do and not every time it could be. This concludes the list of tips and tricks to improve the bot running time and minimize their idle time. We have seen the time-saving potential of designing from the beginning a good architecture. We have seen how using different process and activity types different triggering methods or using APIs could save a lot of time without additional costs. And we have also considered the trade-off between hardware and software costs as a potential saving source. I hope this will give you some ideas to improve your most critical automations, as well as allow you to form a mindset of efficiency when it comes to automation. If you know of any other tips to save time when it comes to bots running or idle time, please share them with the community in the comment section below. If you found this video inspiring, please hit the like button and consider subscribing to be informed of upcoming new videos. Thank you for watching and have a great day!